Welcome, everyone, to this Good Leadership Podcast. My name is Charles Good, your host and the president of the Institute for Management Studies. This podcast is designed to provide you with actionable insights and tools that you can use from discussing the research, stories, and background from recognized experts and practitioners to accelerate your impact in your current role. Well, welcome to this episode of the Good Leadership Podcast. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by Dr. Louise Kelly, who is a professor of management and leadership at the University of Laverne. She is a nationally recognized expert on strategy and leadership and has a passion for helping people and organizations unleash their management, leadership, and innovation potential. She publishes widely and has authored five books, including A Dictionary of Strategy, Entrepreneurial Women, A New Leadership and Management Models, and The Psychologist Manager, as well as Existential Systems Approach to Managing Organizations. Welcome to the program, Louise. I'm thrilled to be here, Charles. Great to have this discussion. Well, we'd like to start out each episode with our listeners learning more about you. So if you could provide us some background information on you and really what got you interested on this topic. I did my doctorate in Montreal, seemed like eons ago, and it was a joint program with four university consortium. And there was a famous strategy thinker, uh, Henry Mintzberg, you might've heard of him. And he really influenced my thinking on strategic management. And you'll see a lot of the ideas that I, that I have today are come from that sort of a more emergent view of strategy. And that really, really made sense to me. And I, you know, my undergrad was in economics, so kind of that big picture, very macro. And then I found strategy was a way to integrate that with the management part. So that's how I got into this business and uh, I've been doing it ever since. Well, we're very happy to have you on the podcast and let's get into it. Let's first identify or talk about the difference between strategic thinking and strategic planning, because a lot of leaders, from my experience, don't really know the difference. I think it's a, an important distinction. And, and strategic thinking is a sort of a more modern view of things, but they're both necessary. It's not either or. So, you know, we've all been in, in those meetings where we have, you know, the five-year plan and the 10-year vision, and, you know, you seem to be getting lost in a sea of spreadsheets. So how do you kind of break it down? Let's look at the analogy of like a GPS, right? And you set your GPS for strategic planning and it's going to give you the precise directions, you know, the turn by turn that we're all quite familiar with, but you can't, let's say it's a foggy night and you're driving and you can't really see beyond your headlights. So what's, what's going on is your strategic planning approach is not letting you know the details of the road, what's happening right in front of you. And by sticking to that plan, you're missing that real-time information. So I, I would say strategic thinking is more like a topographical map, right? Where you have like the texture of the landscape and you're seeing what's going on and you're seeing the valleys, you're seeing the shortcuts. You're like, hey, maybe we could take this over here. This looks like, uh, or or let's say, Charles, you come up, up on a, you know, a, a roadblock and that, we see that happening all the time. We saw that happening with the supply chain. Some people look at AI as a roadblock. There's a lot going on out there. So how do you navigate around that? And when you're sticking with that strategic planning approach, it's not really giving you that information. So I would say, you know, it's not an either or. And, and if you wanted to like break it down in, in a kind of a general sense, I would say that strategic planning is the what, you know, what is it that you're trying to do here? But I think the strategic thinking really gets into that how, that why. The why is very motivating for people. Uh, where are you going to make this happen? What's it going to look like? You can make an analogy, for example, like let's say you say, well, I need a boat to get across the river. That's what I need to do. I got a lot of these geographic, it's like the art of war. They're always talking about the terrain. So, okay, you need a boat to get across the river. That's the sort of strategy planning approach. But then the strategic thinking is like, okay, so should I build it? Should I buy it? Should I borrow it from a friend? What does that look like? And these are strategic decisions, right? Like if you're going to start a product from scratch, well, that's a huge investment, right? Are you going to do a strategic alliance? Well, that, that makes it a little bit more manageable. You can get to market quicker. So these are the kind of questions that strategic thinking allows you to adapt more, I would say. What would you say when I've seen it with leaders that a lot of senior leaders, really their space is around strategic planning because they believe the future is predictable. Formulation and implementation can be divided. But with strategic thinking, it really can impact leaders at all levels. They can take part in that. They can be, be a part of maybe not the plan, but the planning of it. 
Do you find that from your work and from the companies that you've dealt with? Oh, a- absolutely. And, you know, I, w- I would like make the analogy uh, that, you know, strategic planning is almost more like the flip phone, right, that we used to have. And the smartphones are more what I would think the strategic thinking is, where it's giving you that real-time information. And I think one of the words that I would want to highlight, Charles, is adaptability, is that ability to adapt to changing circumstances. So you don't always have the precision that your strategic plan wanted, you know, to map that all out for you. And, and, and you definitely do need that big vision and the strategic planning can help with that. But it's that adaptability where you're able to change in, in real time. I think that's becoming more and more important. And so, you know, what I have found working with executives, it is a transition to kind of go, oh, OK, so the strategic planning is not just a C-suite. We want to see this at all levels in the organization. And I think of some companies, you know, one company that was a real ahead of the curve on this, well, originally GE back in the day, but a more recent example is Home Depot. And Home Depot had, was known for require, I mean, it was a tough atmosphere to be a manager, but because they were known for requiring operational efficiency and effectiveness and all that, right, in terms of the plans of the managers, but they also wanted strategic plans from middle managers. And that was that was really a game changer in industry. And GE had started it with their GE University, right? Croton on Hudson. So they'd started that. And, and I think Ho- Home Depot ran with it. And, and you know, the thing is, Charles, like you look at a lot of the managers from Home Depot, what did they go and do? They went and became CEOs of their own company because they had been forced to do that strategic planning. So I think it is something that people are kind of like, wait a minute, you know, can I really sort of let go of the reins and and let other people in on this conversation? And the answer is not only can you, you have to, because if you're not doing that, you're missing that intimacy with the customer that people in the, in the lower levels of the organization have. I mean, sure, when you're in top management, you can see some big picture stuff that other folks aren't seeing because of where you are in the organization. But then there's that kind of intimate knowledge of the customer, the preferences, and kind of toggling back and forth between those two. Like some people use the analogy of like bifocals or some people have trifocals, whatever that looks like. But, you know, so you're seeing, you know, one picture here and then you're looking down and getting some more detail. And that's what you can get by including uh, your middle managers. And the other thing, Charles, you and I know, I mean, you've been working with organizations a long time. I mean, half the battle is the buy-in, and it's actually more than half the battle. I would say 30% of the success would be, you know, your strategic planning, et cetera. 70% is implementation, and that involves the real-time strategic thinking. So you got to get buy-in, too. And when you include people in the process, that can make a big difference. And I just want to say one last thing is that including people in the process, that it takes time to learn that skill. So you got to be patient with people to sort of get into a new area. Let's move into some of those myths of strategic thinking. One of the big ones that I have seen in strategic thinking is about thinking of big ideas. If you could just speak to that, and then if there's another one that you've seen throughout your work that is um, prevalent. Yeah, so think about the big ideas. Absolutely, that is what strategy is about. But when you think about like a big idea that is getting implemented, like I don't know, Tesla dominating in, in the EV industry or, you know, coming up with that new vision of what a car is. Sure, that's a big idea, right? And you do need those. But then you got someone like Elon Musk, you know, sleeping on the factory floor because there are, you know, 300 decisions that are needed to be made to support that. And that's where you really get the in- innovation is in that granular, you know, the set of decisions that you want to be making them, not like you're on a roller coaster, just going up and down in sort of reactive mode. You want to be making them with that big picture, but also with that strategic thinking. How can we take advantage of this? You know, I I always think that uh, Jeff Bezos' decision with Amazon when he went into what we now, now called Amazon Web Service, I would have loved to be at that board meeting when Jeff came in and said, okay, you know, we've been selling books and shoes and furniture and all this. Now we're going to be sell, selling cloud computing. And people are like, what? But what he was looking at, he's, he's looking at, here's my expense item, right? Which there's no way you get through the Christmas rush. 
without huge computing power. And so, you know, he had the big idea of Amazon and customer service, but in the implementation, he's like, Hey, I'm paying a lot of money for this. And we only use it once a year for, you know, at its maximum capacity. I'm, I'm going to sell that to other people, turning an expense into a revenue item. Wow. Right. But that comes from running the business and making those decisions. So it's not just the one big idea. It's those two, 300 ideas that support that and, and make it happen. I think that's very important. Yeah, we spoke about this earlier, but another myth that I see is being strategic is only required for those at the top. So hopefully we've dispelled that myth already. Yeah, I mean, this is this is a major misconception that the strategic thinking, strategic planning is only for the C-suite. You are so missing out if you're not involving people throughout the organization. And, and I think that, you know, when I do my consulting and working uh, with companies, that's kind of been my trademark from the beginning is creating a more inclusive. You want to have diverse opinions, right? Like you look at the generational diversity, right? We know there's just totally different ways of thinking out there. You look at, you know, ethnic diversity, you look at the way people think differently, you want to draw them all into the conversation. So, you know, I think you should think of strategy as more like a Swiss army knife, right? Like something that you can tackle everyday challenges. Oh, I got to open this bottle. I got to do this. You have that tool and you can apply that. And you and I've talked about some of the tools that we really love, like, you know, Porter's Five Forces. That's, that's a tool. You can kind of bring that out. Okay, what are we doing here with the supply chain? Let's take a look at the, you know, the forces underlying it. And that's that kind of Swiss army knife. So it shouldn't be like this. Oh, it's just for the boardroom. That is a real misconception about strategy. So you, you don't need a corner office to think strategically, uh, although it may get you to the corner office if, if you jump in and start doing that. Very well said. Let's look at the attributes of strategic thinkers. You have listed a few. Is there anyone that is most important to start with of those attributes that you list? Okay. Well, I think we have to start with the vision. You've got to have some kind of vision of the future. So you can't just manage the day-to-day -day tasks, get operational efficiency. You've got to have that GPS set to success and have some idea of what that's gonna look like. So I think number one vision, another thing that I think is crucial is embracing ambiguity. You know, whereas I do this uh, assessment with my students, it's like a three minute assessment, it's called SCARF. And it, it talks about your motivators, right? And it's like status, certainty, and agreeableness, a bunch of stuff. Well, I find my students rate very high on certainty. You know what? It's not a perfect fit with strategy. You you can't have that certainty. It's ambiguous. And and if you can embrace that ambiguity. And and of course you need data. You need to find that data, but you never get, you know, you might have 70% of the data that you need and then you have to kind of go with it. Another thing that's really important for strategy is you got to be a decision maker. You got to you got to actually make that those decisions. There's a famous story of, do you remember the story of Andy Grove at Intel? As a going way back. And he he really agonized over the decision about whether to get out of the memory chip market. He spent two years on it, Charles. And then, you know, one day, I mean the guy was a brilliant guy. And then one day he did a thought experiment and he said, okay, let's imagine I'm advising myself. I'm not Andy Grove, but I'm, and so he kind of went, put himself as a thought exercise outside. Answer came to him immediately, get rid of the memory chip. And when he did it, he thought, oh, it's 50% of our revenue. How are we going to do this? When he did it, the uh, supply chain folks are like, why did it take you so long? You got to not get into the analysis paralysis. You know, it's important to have those discussions, sense making, but you know, pushing off decisions, that's when you become an also-ran company is, is when you look at that. I think the, one of the most important things that I've heard from leaders during their strategic thinking, strategic planning sessions is you got to ask the right questions. It, that's so critical. It's not about having the right answers. It's about asking the right questions so you can develop a strategy that works. 
I, I couldn't agree more. You know, when, when Tim Cook came on as CEO of Apple and, you know, of course you got Steve Jobs as your predecessor. It was a pretty hard act to follow, right? But, you know, he'd been working for years at the company and a uh, super smart guy. In fact, he's created more value than Steve Jobs in a way since he's been running it. But, you know, that was one of the things, Charles, about him is that people got a little unnerved when they start to be in meetings with Tim Cook because why? He'd be asking a lot of questions. And at first, people thought, oh, it's like a gotcha question. You know, he's just trying to put me on the spot. And then they realized, you know, with this kind of quiet demeanor, it's not a gotcha. These are just thoughtful questions that we all need to be thinking about. And he kind of modeled that behavior. And like you said, you don't always have to know the answers. It's sometimes you have to live with, well, we don't know the answer to this question, but let's ask it. Because that's one of the things, Charles, people only want to ask the questions they have an answer to. But that's not being strategic. You got to ask the questions that you don't know the answer, but you're willing. And that again goes to the ambiguity. You're willing to sit with that discomfort. You know, I also like to think of strategists as being like a little bit like Sherlock Holmes, you know, like following the data, following the clues. And like you're saying, you know, what are the past trends? But how's that? What are the discontinuities with the future, right? Like we're living in a, in a situation right now or a moment with the AI being a complete game changer. I mean, this is like inventing the internet again, right? It's like, whoa, where, where are we going with this? And, and point of fact, nobody really knows, right? But you got to be willing to delve in and say, okay, what would it look like for my business to adopt that? So I think uh, that detective looking at the past trends, looking at the future and really connecting those dots. And and one of the things with connecting the dots is like, there's not one way to do it, right? Like somebody else could tell a story. You and I were talking about storylines earlier. It's like, how do you make sense of that data? What is the kind of storyline that is kind of jumping out at you? And another Bezos example is he used to ban PowerPoint from presentations because he wanted to hear the story. And where does the story come? It comes from asking those questions and trying to understand what has been happening and what that's going to look like in the future. Why don't we move to the tools now and let's unpack the one type of strategy that's common in today's uh, competitive landscape. It's kind of the ideal strategy that everyone's trying to look for. And that's the blue ocean strategy. It's a famous, based off of a famous book on two researchers. Give us some insights into what this strategy really is, Luis, and then we're going to work through it uh, with an example. What is the basic idea of Blue Ocean? And you're right, it's really been taking industry by storm, this, this, this tool. It's been, a, it's been a blockbuster success, I would say. So think about the visual, Charles. It's like a vast open sea. Like anybody thinking of a Blue Ocean, all of a sudden you're relaxed. This is great. And it's untapped opportunities, right? Sailing into that sea. It's a great metaphor. Right. And what the blue ocean is really about is creating these new market spaces where there's no competition. The competition is irrelevant because they're not there. Right. And they kind of contrast that with the red ocean, which just imagine that metaphor. And I love that they use metaphors. It's a great way to learn strategy is the metaphor. So the red ocean is where, you know, the sharks are swimming. Right. And it's kind of bloody from from getting torn out. So that's the idea of uh, a blue ocean strategy is it's those getting in those uncontested spaces and just think of that relaxation. That's where you want to be. But how do you get there? And, and the thing I love about the blue ocean, Charles, and we, we can't break it all down today. We can talk about some of the details, but it really is a bit of a method methodology. It's like, it's not like, okay, you, you got to be Elon Musk to come up with this blue ocean. No, no, no. Here's, here's some ways to get there. Here's some questions you need to ask. You're right. And it has different parts of it. One part that I really enjoy is the eliminate, reduce, raise, or create phase where companies are advised to analyze their existing products and services and make strategic decisions regarding of what to eliminate, reduce, raise their investment on or create to deliver more value to their customers. And that's something everyone can do regardless of the role they're in, in that strategic thinking process. So why don't we now look at this blue ocean strategy? Because it's really tough to create many. It's the ideal. Many companies would like to say that they're getting closer to it, but very few, in my opinion, have succeeded in creating it. One of those, I think it's that has is Cirque du Soleil, which is the Canadian entertainment company founded in 1984. 
It gained global recognition for its unique blend of circus acts and theater. If you go to Las Vegas, I think the majority, if not all of the shows are now Cirque du Soleil shows. The success of it can be attributed to its effective implementation of the Blue Ocean strategy, which allowed it to create a new market space and differentiate itself from traditional circuses. So provide us some more detail on this company and how it's really utilized the Blue Ocean strategy. Yeah, no, I love this. It's, of course, it's my hometown. Montreal is uh, where this started. And, you know, it's really interesting. They combined elements of different industries, and that's where you create a new industry when you're taking a bit from this industry and a bit from that and cobbling it together. So basically, I would say they really combined the circus atmosphere, right? The circus that elements, elements of the circus, not everything. And then theater, right? And then theater has more this connotation of like the big themes, maybe the costumes, the sort of more artistic side, right? And the circus has more that kind of wow factor and getting you, you know, out of your everyday life into seeing, you know, tricks and seeing people, you know, take some, you know, leaps on the trapeze and all that kind of thing. And putting those two together, nobody had done it before. And, you know, when you talk about that reduce and eliminate model and then the create, which is really important, they eliminated, for example, animals, right? And of course, we know what happened with the Ringling Brothers and the elephants and all that, like society moved on and we didn't want to see animals treated that way. But it's, it's even bigger than that. It creates a whole logistics problem. It locks you into a certain thing. They're like, we're not going there. We're just not going to do it. Now, now that, Charles, is probably the hardest thing to do is say, we're just not doing that. And companies are afraid to do that because they're like, well, that's a necessary bar for competition, you know, that sort of benchmarking approach. Like, here's the benchmark of the industry. But if you want to do Blue Ocean, you have to be willing to let go of things. And, and you know, there's a cognitive bias that we talk about, which is loss aversion. I don't know if you ever heard of it, but there's a whole long list of our biases. And they're worth studying when you do strategy because, you you know, you can be subject to them quite easily. And so loss aversion is people don't want to give up something they have, right? So let's say I give you a cup and it's worth a dollar. And I say, Charles, give me back that cup. I'll give you $5, right? So you, logically you could get five cups, you know, with that five bucks, but you're like, nope, I got this. Cause and that's loss aversion. Once you have something, so industries don't want to give something up because they think, well, that's necessary. And the blue ocean strategy, you're really willing to do that, but you're, you're willing to add stuff, right? And that's, so the money and the time that you take away from the things that you're reducing and eliminating allows you to spend that money, time, energy on the new stuff. And so this completely new form of entertainment, I mean, you could call, you know, it's like a Picasso of the entertainment world, right? Cirque du Soleil. It's like a wow factor. And, and you know, you mentioned Vegas. I mean, Vegas is always looking for something that's going to get people to pay that high pick, ticket price. But people feel like they're getting the value out of Cirque du Soleil because it's so original. So I think, you know, they eliminated things like, you know, uh, concessions, comedians, clowns, you know, the animals, but then they added, you know, the themes, the artistic themes, you know, each show has its own theme and they just ran with that. Now, like any company, they ran into some problems just before the pandemic and during, obviously during the pandemic, but they have come out of that again and they're sticking to that uh, blue ocean strategy and it's working well for them. Well, and strategy is really about trade-offs and it's, and it's choosing what not to do. So I love that approach with what are you going to eliminate and reduce? Because you can't do it all effectively. And you're right. They eliminated animals. They reduced the reliance on star performers, creating a more collaborative ensemble-based show so that they could raise the stakes and create something brand new. The production value of the shows took it to unprecedented levels, created new market space by combining elements of theater, circus arts, and live entertainment. And, and they really captured a lot more of the market, uh, more a new market for that because they they took advantage of merchandise sales, licensing agreements, and resident shows in major cities since it wasn't in a tent that got moved from city to city. It was in a permanent venue. So a lot of great things in what they did, but just really emphasizing that point that a lot of strategies about trade-offs and agreeing not to do certain things. Yeah. And you know what I would say when you look at that blue ocean strategy, you really want to think about innovation, not imitation. 
So it's not about imitating what, you know, the big boys and girls in the industry are doing. It's about really innovating. And that's what they did. And, you know, I think if you ask anybody who's been to a Cirque du Soleil show, they don't forget that experience. It's a very memorable experience, which is why people are willing to pay the, you know, the big bucks when they go to Vegas to see those. You're right. I've seen many myself, so uh, <laughs> I can personally attest to that. Let's let's move into another strategic thinking tool that's commonly used, and that's the Porter's Five Forces model. And that's really used to analyze industry structure. So walk us through that model, and then we're going to use it to analyze a company. The five forces, like the name implies, you know, we're talking about five different forces that determine the landscape of the industry. So this doesn't tell you what your strategy needs to be, but it gives you the lay of the land. And, you know, where's the danger points, where's the stress points and gives you some insight. Then you can make your strategic decisions based on that. And Michael Porter, I mean, brilliant strategy professor from Harvard and, you know, Harvard's famous for the case study approach. And he started giving his students notes and included the five forces. And the other professors were like, no, you can't do that. You know, that's that's not the case method, right? The pure case method. And he's like, you know what? They need something to break this down. And I think it's a wonderful tool to get your, your feet wet. So let's let's look at the different elements of that. So the first force is, I like to look at, is the threat of new entrants. Okay, so it's the idea that how do you build a fortress? How do you build a castle, uh, a moat to keep out those new entrants? What does that look like? And you want to have those high barriers to entry for new competitors. And typically those will be things like brand name, right? So it's really, I mean, do we see a lot of competitors to Starbucks in the coffee space, right? You got one or two, but yeah, I'm not seeing a lot of new entrants there. They've, they've got that strong barrier to entry with that brand name. There can be other barriers to entry. Sometimes it's capital costs or unique technology. The second one is supplier power. So this is where, you know, what are the ingredients to make your product the wow product that you want it to be? So you're dependent on suppliers for these raw materials. And what happens here is if you have some very special supply, for example, like Back in the day when Intel was calling the shots in the PC industry, you had to have an Intel in like, Well, what did that mean? Intel got to call the shots, got to say, this is how much you have to pay. And by the way, you have to advertise our product on your PCs. So there's an example of fantastic supplier power. Then you take another, and that's not good for the companies, right? The stronger the forces are, the more problematic it is for companies. So when you have higher supplier power, that makes the industry less attractive. It doesn't mean you can't find your way through it, but uh, how are you going to position yourself? A good example uh, with supplier power, a couple that come to mind. If you think of uh, Walmart and their supply chain, well, they're famous for being extremely tough, right? Well, what does it mean if you're tough? It means you call the shots. You say, well, here's the price point. Here's the quality. I want packaging this size because they have such huge market power, right? As Walmart, you know, 90 customers a month in America, in the U S so that is gives Walmart power over their suppliers. Cause it's like, well, if you're not going to sell Walmart then good luck, you know, yeah. And we're trying to find customers. Another example is a lot of folks criticized or kind of actually laughed at Elon Musk when he started doing some vertical integration for the batteries and they're like, no, you can't, you know, lock yourself in here comes a pandemic. <laughs> Nobody can get those supplies. And, you know, that vertical integration, and, and that's a good example. Industries were moving away from vertical integration because they're like, hey, we need to be as, as flexible as possible. Absolutely, you do. But now we're seeing how vertical integration can give you a leg up on, on competitors. The next one is buyer power. And, and that's where you're like, let's say, for example, in the pharmaceutical industry, who are the buyers? Well, it's the insurance companies and the healthcare providers, right? They're the ones writing the script and they can, in fact, negotiate for lower prices. You see the federal government's negotiating, uh, I think it's 10 of the drug prices for, for Medicare, right? So then the buyer power, when you have 
a big, like Medicare is a big buyer. When you you saw the insurance companies getting bigger, you know, like Kaiser here in California, that gives you buyer power. Sometimes when you're talking about individual buyers, like all of us out there, it could be information that can give you a uh, buyer power. So if you think, Charles, what it's like to buy a car now versus, you know, 10, 15 years ago, I mean, Whatever car you want, you'll know exactly how much it costs in the factories to make it. You'll know how many in the color you want are in California. That is an example of buyer power where as consumers, we have a lot more information. And I will say one trend line that we're, we see across all industries of buyer power is it's going up. The power of the buyer is, is, is getting more powerful. And of course, the more power the buyers have, the harder it is to make a profit. So again, every time those forces are stronger, it, it doesn't mean that defines your strategy, but it means you got to be you know, nimble in relationship to that. That brings me to the fourth one, threat of substitutes. And, and pharmaceutical is a good example uh, in that industry. So when you have the kind of the moat, the fortress of your, you know, new drug that's very successful, and then a suddenly a generic version comes along, what, you know, after the patent has run out. Okay, this is the ultimate substitute product because you've got something that's got the same efficacy or more or less, you know, and then it's uh, generic. It, it, you know, it could be half the price or more or, or less. So a substitute product is something that can meet that uh, need. And sometimes it comes from a totally different industry. When going through the pandemic, we all got into the Zoom world, right? Uh, heavily into Zoom. And, you know, business travel, it's still there. It's still significant, but people are thinking about it differently because they see Zoom and other web conferencing as a substitute is a lot cheaper in terms of time and energy to have those meetings that way. Is it a perfect substitute? Absolutely not. You know, the face-to-face -face interaction is so much more powerful. So threat of substitute products are, they're a lower price point and they're meeting a significant part of what the original product. I mean, you could even say like a smartphone ended up being a bit of a substitute for some of the PCs. People could run their whole business, you know, just on their smartphone. Oh, oh competitive rivalry. I forgot the most important one. Okay, so that is, uh, that, that all leads into that. That's the five forces. All those four other forces, right, lead into the competitive rivalry. And that's really where you're talking about the fierce, competition and jockeying for position. That's when you're getting into the ring and, you know, some people are going to make it, some are not. The more intense the rivalry, then the more narrow the profit margin is, is going to be. So it's like, okay, do you have a lot of competitors? That's one set of problems. Do you have evenly matched competitors? You know, the Coke, Pepsi, the beer wars, that kind of thing. So when you have like, let's say, one or two big companies dominating the industry, which we often see, right? Then they have to pour enormous amount of money into advertising the celebrity endorsements and all that, because it's just, they're going head to head. There's no blue ocean there when you've got that kind of rivalry going on. So the analogy that I would offer for the Porter's Five Forces, which is a classic tool, but still very powerful, it's like an x-ray machine. It gives you insight into the underlying forces in the industry and shows you where the pressure points are, shows you where the opportunities are. And, you know, strategy is all about that, that two things, I would say, you know, macro point of view, like you're looking at the big picture, the big landscape. But it's also drilling down to those basic assumptions. What are the basic underlying dynamics? Who has the power here in this industry? And by the way, you can, one of the kind of, if you're having trouble figuring out your port of five forces, you know, like supplier power, just look at the profit margins. If you see the profit margins of the suppliers outpacing, you know, who they're supplying, then you know, I mean, if you look at the movie exhibition industry, it's taken a beating. They're not, you know, the profit margins are so slim. That's because they don't have power in the industry. It's really the streaming companies that have that power now. So wanted to ask you a question because I because I hear this a lot too that they use the Porter's Five Forces and they use SWOT analysis. So what are the differences between the two for our listeners? And when should they use each one? I am not the biggest fan of SWAT, but I know a lot of people love it. The, the problem I have sometimes with SWAT is that the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats is that you 
it becomes a laundry list, right? Where it's like, okay, here's our strong points, here's our weak points, and then how do you kind of put it together? I, I think SWAT can be made more dynamic when you use something which they often call TOES, you know, the sort of uh, opposite way of the acronym, where you take a strength and you pair it with an opportunity and you have to come up with a strategy. So that's where I like the SWAT is when you, you try to mix it up. Like remember we talked about ingredients, right? So you're seeing a lot of in cooking, you see a lot of uh, fusion cooking, right? We so with Korean Mexican and how do you put that together? So like the toes is like mixing up the internal analysis with external analysis then coming up with the strategy. So that that's to me the best way of looking at the SWOT or the toes analysis. I think the big difference with the Portis Five Forces is it's really very much industry-based. What's going on with the competitors? And with the SWOT, sometimes you're really not getting into that competitive dynamic at the same level you should be. And, you know, I find with executives, with managers, there's sort of a goldfish bowl effect where you're kind of looking at each other in the management team or, you know, other departments, and you're getting into that kind of overly focused on your world, right? Like the company's world. And I think that the Portis Five Forces gets you into the competitors. What's going on out there? Because it's really the competitors who could end up eating your lunch, right? And those who understand the forces in the industry before the others do are in a much better position. And I think, you know, in strategy, we have, you know, I was using the word toggle back and forth, right? So you think of like a focus where you're focusing in and then you're zooming out like a new iPhone, right? But when they gave you those automatic focus buttons, right? So you can go zoom in or you can take that big kind of landscape. And I think that the, the beauty of the five forces is by zooming in and getting and breaking it down like we just did, you, you got to remember to zoom back out and look at, okay, so now what do we do with this? I just find that the Portis Five Forces creates more dynamic conversation about competitors and strategy than SWAT, but there definitely is a place for both. And I, I would say that the opportunities threats part of SWAT is the industry part. And the strengths and weaknesses is obviously the internal part of the company. So there we go. I guess I'm a I guess I'm a Portis Five Forces fan more than more than anything. But of course, Blue Ocean is is a game changer as well. well let's move into analyzing a company because I love to give them the tools, but I also, more importantly, like to show them how to use those tools. Let's use the Porter's Five Forces analysis to evaluate the competitive forces within the technology and consumer electronics industry, which is where Apple resides. So I'll go through each one, setting it up a little bit, and then perhaps you can speak in a little more depth to each one of these forces that's really impacting Apple. The first one is the threat of new entrants. That is low. There's economies of scale that's going on that Apple benefits from. There's brand loyalty that Apple really um, enjoys a very strong amount of, and high capital requirements by other companies to get in the space. Yeah. And I think, you know, so if you're talking about uh, threat of new entrants, you're absolutely right about it's, it is low. And I think one of the things that you see with Apple that has allowed them to minimize that threat is the ecosystem integration. So once, once you get into the Apple world, you know, many of us have the watch and then we have the, I mean, look, if they come out with an Apple car, I don't know, already got an EV, I'll probably have to get it, right? Because that integration, the idea of that seamless getting into my car and it's going to know my schedule and it's going to know all that. So these things seamlessly working together, this creates what we call high switching costs. So going from the Apple ecosystem into now, sure, the Android is, is out there and it's doing well. And those are the two big rivals, clearly, right? But you're not seeing anyone else getting into the space because it's that, that's been kind of carved up. So I would say that the ecosystem integration really acts as a barrier to new entrants, absolutely. How about for bargaining power of suppliers? Um, I would say that it's moderate. And I've seen Apple use a very diverse supplier base, so reducing its dependence on any single supplier. I think they have done a masterful job in supply chain management. At, and, and again, that's Tim Cook, you know, he's kind of a quiet guy and not, you know, not as flashy as maybe his predecessor. But, but what 
where Apple really excels, I mean, they excel in many areas, but is the supply chain management. So you see they have a tight control over their supply chain from the manufacturing all the way to distribution. They have to do that because just like we were saying, you know, like, let's say uh, the analogy is like you're running a restaurant and, you know, you have this star chef and they start, you know, buying the most expensive ingredients that, that are out there, that's going to change your whole cost structure, right? So they have to minimize their costs. But as we know, Apple has its a differentiation strategy based on quality. So they can't minimize the costs, but be subject to low quality. So that's where they have to have a tight control. They're quick to react to problems in, in their supply chain. So they basically kind of own the whole supply chain, not literally own it, but own it through their management process of how they interact with their suppliers, which a lot of them are in China. Now, right now, you'll see Apple is a diversifying outside of China. We're seeing a lot of problems in China, whether that be geopolitical, you know, the employment base, a lot of stuff going on in China right now. And Apple's realizing, hey, that's been our supply chain, basically, right? So now we we have to look at, at some other, develop some other supplier relationships. So I think that's very key. And also Apple keeps their inventory management very low. That reduces their costs as well. So I think they're really Excel. I mean, you look at a company like Walmart and you look at Apple, they are like the king and queen of uh, supply chain management, in my view. Well, moving now to bargaining power of buyers, you say it's going up across the board. And I would argue that in this industry, it's moderate to high. Consumers have a lot of choices. And the premium pricing of Apple really forces them to deliver something of quality because there is a plethora of competition in great products that's waiting to take its place. Yeah, you know, I think one of the things that really uh, protects Apple, and look, they've understood the sensitivity to price. And they did come out with a lower uh, price version of the iPhone. But I really think they're competing on design excellence. And that really sets them apart. And I think what's happening is, you know, Apple has always been, it's not just about the gadget that's in your hand. It's about your lifestyle. It's about your aesthetic. I, I, I would say that the design element, you know, we were talking about Cirque du Soleil and, and what they did with designing the theater. Apple's like that too. This is a work of art. This is not just a device. This is really a work of art. And it makes a statement about who you are as, as a person. And if you look at, you know, the 1 billion Apple users and I, uh, iOS uh, folks, these people have the most money in the world to spend. This is the most sought after consumer. And I think that Apple locks them in with the design excellence. Also other things like uh, customer service, they're pretty cutting edge on that too. You, f I, I don't know, you feel like you have a concierge service, you phone up, you know, the Apple support, you got a two, three minute wait, and then people are willing to delve into things. I think that's huge today. I mean, who's not feeling overwhelmed with their passwords and, their, you know, getting in there. So you have that kind of concierge service. So um, it's really for the, like, they've always put positioned themselves as, hey, we're for the creators, you know, we're for the people, the creative types. And I think in the economy that we're in, people want to be identified with that kind of brand name. So that's how I see them working with the buyer power. Moving on then to the threat of substitutes, that's moderate. You mentioned it before. It's moderate only because of that ecosystem lock-in because there's lots of substitute products. But once you're vested in the ecosystem, it's really hard to get out of it unless you want to lose a lot of those apps that you love and information that you have on that device. Yeah, there's that. And I think another thing is the, that that protects Apple to some extent against you know the, the substitute products is, is the product innovation. They're always coming up with something or two or three things that really can make you ahead of the curve, right? And people don't want to be left behind on that. They're considered cutting edge and, and the field is changing very rapidly. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to some of the things that they'll probably be doing with wearables in the future. We're getting more concerned with our, you know, monitoring our health data on a regular basis. And you kind of know that Apple's going to be a, at the forefront. And, and I'll give you just an example. You know, when Meta came out with those, those glasses, you know, the Oculus, kind of a flop, right? They don't have that design excellence. They don't have that reputation for being the cutting edge performance of their device. But you know, with Apple, they really haven't had that kind of flop. They've had things that took a longer time, like the Apple Watch 
you know, a lot of my friends were like, ah, oh, what do I need it for? Eventually they came around and they got it because, you know, you, you do want to have that interoperability. So I would think their product innovation protects them a lot from the substitute products. And then the final one is competitive rivalry, which is really high, very intense competition, but really rapid technological changes are happening within this industry all the time. And you also have to worry about market saturation because unless you can move into new markets, you might have filled that void and there's not much growth that can happen in more mature markets. Yeah, I think the competitive rivalry, uh, they do a great job with this. And, uh, you know, they they kind of own the road a little bit with these. And I don't I think that's going to be broken down maybe with some antitrust stuff. But in terms of the app store, right, because if you want to sell your product, you got to go through Apple. So that gives them an advantage, 30% right off the top that they're they're making right there. But in terms of competitive rivalry, one of the things that Apple is famous for is their secrecy. This is a company that lives and dies by their secrecy. And they're very secretive about their product development. Like nobody knows right now, are they going to make the car? Are they not going to make the car? What's happening with that? Nobody really knows. And that secrecy creates that sense of anticipation, that sense of excitement. This is really quite powerful vis-a-vis -vis competitors. And they stop people from copying their ideas too quickly. I mean, look at Samsung. They're so on it and they can come so quickly. I mean, they really do a great job as a second mover. But Apple makes sure they're not the first mover, uh, generally speaking. I think the other thing that you see with Apple, they're, uh, they're a tech company. I mean, their patent portfolio is impressive. They have a vast portfolio of patents. Now, some of those are not even going to pursue. They're just throwing off competitors with that. But they really are making that investment in terms of innovation that's going to be long term. So I think that puts them in a really good position with the competitive rivalry. But you know what? I'm sure Tim Cook's worried about it all the time. Because, I mean, look what Samsung has done. And, of course, the classic example, right, going back to history, whatever, Nokia, right, used to have 80% of the market. Now, you know, they don't re even really exist in that market. So I think everybody knows you, you can't rest on your laurels. And when Apple comes out with a new product, it has to be a huge moneymaker for a company that size. And um, so they have to really put their resources. And again, if I make the contrast with Meta and Zuckerberg, he, you know, this is that $10 billion bet that kind of, uh, with the Oculus that that fell on its face. And you don't see Apple doing that. They want to protect themselves in that way. So I, I still put my money on Apple for uh, winning the competitive rivalry, I would say. Well, thank you for, for providing those insights. I think that was instructive to go through that process with the Porter's framework to analyze that industry and really give some insights into why Apple has been so successful for so long. Wanted to just cover in a little bit higher level of detail one more company in a different space, and that's Costco. And, and really what's differentiated that company in, once again, a very competitive market, you has to compete against Walmart. You might say it's a more of a niche market. Costco is occupying that warehouse membership club market. But let's briefly go through that process with Costco, just to give our listeners, once again, some insight into what makes them so profitable and differentiates their brand in this very competitive market. And once again, let's start out with the threat of new entrants. I would say is low because it's a membership model, which means it creates a barrier to entry. New entrants, uh, we need to attract a substantial amount of customers to compete with a low cost Costco membership fees. Yeah, absolutely. I think the membership model is brilliant. You don't, again, you don't see it in the industry. This is not typical, but re by requiring that membership as, as a, being able to, you know, shop in the store, you've got that loyal base, like you were saying. So there, you know, we, because probably a lot of our listeners are uh, Costco members and worldwide, they're doing strong. You feel like you're kind of in a VIP club, right? Like you've got this, this membership and, and other people can't access that. And that gives you the access to the great deals. Right. And and so I think that is a real that's a real moat, I would say, uh, in, in their industry. So I think that's a great competitive strategy for threatening new entrants. Absolutely. So about bargaining supplier, um, bargaining power suppliers, moderate to low. What I love about Costco is what Trader Joe's does as well. They do a lot of private label brands and they diversify their supplier base to minimize that supplier power. 
Yeah, absolutely. Again, like Apple, they're a low inventory model. That's one way of minimizing those costs. They don't have a uh, storage costs, right? They're, uh, and, and so low inventory, low storage, they pass that on directly to the customer. And so it's very much the efficiency of their supply chain. They're like a well-oiled machine. And I, you know, you mentioned the, the private labels, like the Kirkland signature. What you've got is you've got high quality, low price. I mean, that's an unbeatable combination, right? So that gives them, by, by having that private label, the profit margins are a lot higher. And that that's, gives them a leg up in terms of the relative power of the suppliers, because they will always have their own products that they can sell. And of course they have, have the um, other suppliers, but they always have something they can fall back on. So that gives them some choices, right? Absolutely. Bargaining power of buyers moderate to high. Once again, Costco has a low cost strategy. So its customers are price sensitive. Any significant increase in prices could lead to reduced sales. This is their model, right? This is the core of their model is that they have the no frills store layout, right? Where you're just, you're kind of navigating your way. It's almost like, almost like a treasure hunt in Costco. You never know what you're going to find, right? It's always moved around different places. So everything has its place. Having that simple organization principle for the store, which is, you know, not spending a lot of time placing everything and product placement, they can pass that that uh, savings on to the customer. And, and that's very important. The other thing that they don't spend money on is advertising, right? So they're really very low on advertising. Like if you were to compare them to Walmart, they're really relying more on uh, word of mouth. And that's how people, people are always talking about Costco and what they found. And you go to a dinner party and you're like, oh, where'd you get that spread of cheese? Oh, well, that was Costco. So they use that word of mouth for the no frills shopping experience. And I think that keeps the low prices, high quality, which, you know, gives them some uh, leg up versus the buyer power. Because people, I mean, especially with inflation, people were, you know, making some wise choices and Costco just sailed right through that because of their, their integrated strategy. Completely agree with you. Uh, next, uh, threat of substitutes. You could argue that it's moderate. The membership benefits help to mitigate some of those threats of substitutes, but not all the way. Yeah, you know, one of the things that often gets overlooked with Costco, but they have a really generous return policy. And it's funny, I was at uh, the chiropractor the other day and he's always talking about air quality in our lungs and making sure that's all good. And he says, oh, make sure you buy it at Costco because if it breaks down, you can just return it. I think that creates some, some uh, efficiency vis-a-vis -vis other venues to get the same product because not efficiency, that's not the right word, but it attracts people that they feel reassured. Hey, I can buy it through Costco. If it's not going to work out, I know I can return it. It gives you that sense of confidence, that safety net, and that will take you away from competitors where you're not able to do that. So I think that's part of it vis-a-vis -vis substitutes. And the final piece is competitive rivalry, very high because it's competing against both traditional retailers like Walmart, as well as online giants like Amazon things I think about Costco is in terms of their competitive rivalry is the employee satisfaction, you know, satisfied, happy employees who are engaged in their work can be a great competitive advantage when it comes to that rivalry. Where do you want to go and spend your time shopping? I think that Costco and Trader Joe, they, they have different strategies, very different. We talked about that one before, but they both have a high level of employee satisfaction. You've got happy employees. What does that translate into? You've got satisfied customers. You enjoy being there. It's a nice atmosphere for the people working there. And they do that by, you know, they have uh, holidays for their employees that other retailers don't honor. They're generous. And that translates into really caring about the shopping experience for, so you're not having a great shopping experience in terms of this, you know, store layout is kind of like a warehouse, but you are having this treasure hunt experience. You're also having, you never know what you're going to find, what bargains you're going to, but you're also having a pleasant atmosphere with engaged employees. And you know what, Charles, I think this is becoming more and more important as a competitive rivalry tool. Uh, so that's one thing that strikes me in terms of their rivalry, how they distinguish themselves from competitors.
Great. Well, thank you for going through that analysis with me. As we're nearing the end of this episode, always want to leave listeners with a call to action. What would you recommend for our listeners to do first to improve or strengthen their strategic thinking muscle? Well, I think one of the things that I would recommend is just jump right in, jump right into strategy. Do not think, well, I've you know, I'm not a senior executive, therefore I should not be involved in uh, strategic thinking. Jump right in. You, It's a skill. Think of it like baseball. You got to swing for the ball. That's how uh, you learn to be a good baseball player. It is a skill you can develop. This is not something that only a brilliant few have. Use the tools, the tools, the blue ocean strategy thinking innovating, not not imitating. The port is five forces. How can I break down what's going on in the industry to get some ideas? The other thing I would say is talk to people outside of your industry. That is a great way to get new insights into your industry. Try to, try to get out of the goldfish bowl of your own business and everybody's got the same ideas. Have those conversations about strategy, whether you're going to a conference or going to a training uh, like IMS offers. That really gives you a chance to hear about, hey, how do they do it in other industries? And that can give you some real insight. But the number one thing is jump right in and get started because it's like riding a bike. You're going to be wobbly at first, right? But then you're going to get the hang of it. And then then it's going to feel good. You're like, wait, I can do a lot with this. So that's what I'd recommend. Thank you, Luis, for joining me today on this episode. Remind our listeners how they can get in contact with you and learn more about your work. I'm a professor at University of Laverne here in Los Angeles, and I guess the good way to get in contact with me is how do we connect with, because I, you know, obviously I've got my LinkedIn is a great place to start posting pretty regularly in there. So if you want to uh, connect with me on LinkedIn, that would be a good way to start University of Laverne. And then also um, I'm involved in a lot of these podcasts and trainings. So that's an opportunity to uh, directly connect with me. I also have an Amazon page where I have, I've written, uh, I got a bunch of books right back there, which is, let's see, I just finishing one, uh, number six in Europe, mindfulness for authentic leadership. And so Amazon has an author page. So you can see what I'm doing there as well. If you enjoyed this episode, I encourage you to share with others and post about it on social media. You can also go to our YouTube channel, which has video recordings of all the episodes of this podcast, along with bite-sized segments called single servings that are designed to answer your most pressing leadership and management questions. Remember, until next time, it's not what you know that counts, but what you do consistently that makes a difference.